Well, John, we're at two o'clock. If you uh, want Perfect. to come talk to us about classic sandwiches. Oh, yes. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to talk to you all about sandwiches. And I had a fun month of sandwiches going back and re revisiting all the sandwiches that I have uh, served professionally and that my family loves. Uh, the other day, I I just had I had a can of tuna fish and I and I thought and I didn't consult any anything. I hadn't done any reading on tuna fish or anything. I, I started. I even hard boiled hard hard boiled eggs because I usually have hard boiled eggs in in mine and the, what I've always made for the family. But I thought I right, I need to get I need to do some reading. I need to update this because uh, seniors like tuna fish. My sons uh, my son serves tons of tuna fish and he only has one cook of the 20 cooks who work for him there's only one who can make the tuna fish for his for his fan uh, his uh, customer his clients i'm uh, his residents because they'll just give him uh fits if uh if it's not that person if it's not right and and so i thought I, before I start talking about tuna fish with you all, I better do some homework on it. And I did. And I, uh, I did, I took s some seriously test kitchen recipe and learned a lot of technique. I fixed it for, uh, for Carol for, for lunch. And the first bite, she said, this is delicious. <laughs> I thought, yes, that's good. That's good. Because had I made the same old thing that I always make, I would not have gotten any comment at all other than, oh, this is tuna fish again. Okay, well, let's go to the next one. Let's see. I wanted to, I wanted to emphasize this, how I cook, how I learned to cook and why I cook that way. Uh, we, we have in the, in the, in the um, hospitality industry, this phrase called mise en place, and, and it is the very first thing I believe every culinary instructor talks to their students about. This is the concept of how professional cooking is done. And I have brought that in to the way I cook at home. And it wasn't instantaneously. I didn't step out of the professional kitchen and come home and be the full-time cook for us and, and adopt this. But I have, I have learned that when I don't set up every ingredient and, and weigh it and portion it and trim it and make it sure it's fresh, every ingredient before I start any cooking, actual cooking, then my cooking is not as good. So I promise you that if you will get some portion cups like new ones that I just got and line it up. This, those are the ingredients for my shrimp creole. And you can tell how it's made. The first, the flour and the oil make the roux. Uh, the onions uh, sweat in the roux till they're brown and soft and delicious. And then, then the celery and the uh, green peppers uh, continue to cook in the roux. And then uh, the tomatoes are added and then a little sugar to take this, the garlic is added then, and then the liquid and then this delicious, fabulous, sauce is created and at the very last couple of minutes before you serve it you put the shrimp in there to cook so it, it's a great way to cook i highly recommend it go ahead to the next one please jonathan so if you do that if you cook this way spend all your time oh and then and then everything comes off of the stove and directly into the dishwasher it, I, I've talked about the dishwasher before, but I promise you, if you if you don't do this, and and you instead everything comes off the stove dirty right into the sink and it stacks up, and then you you know all of that stuff, 
it's just double handling everything that you have. I, everything that I have in in that dishwasher right there came out of off the stove into there, including the two pans, the one that made the sauce and one that made the rice. And right into the dishwasher, closed it up, started it up. I had this whole th meal done for us in uh, an hour, I believe. So it's a good way to cook, and I recommend it. Okay. So you, if you do, there's the sauce development, by the way. And I just stacked all those little portion cups up as I as they, as they went into the pan, and um, uh, no no disposables here. This everything gets washed and gets reused just the very next meal. So you feel good because there's very little trash that's generated when you do this. So cleanup's easy. And you just have a have great pride in in being able to efficiently, economically uh, produce meals that are really very gratifying. So, okay. So now sandwiches. You you know I love Breville. I, everything Breville. That is a wonderful company. I think it's Australian, and I think that the quality of their products is just wonderful. I don't own a single Breville appliance. <laughs> I have given them many of them away. My family is completely equipped with all things Breville, including the recent thing that I got for my family that I'd probably have to talk to you about is one of these uh, pressure cookers where you can brown in the pan. It's a, It incorporates both. It's just a marvelous way of cooking that has revolutionized uh, I believe revolutionized cooking in America. I don't have one, but I gave one for Christmas. <laughs> so, but do you need a panini press for sandwiches? I, I say absolutely, unequivocally, categorically, emphatically, you do not need a panini press because there's only, only one sandwich that I'm going to talk about this afternoon that you press, actually press, and they, you can do that without a panini press. So if you had a restaurant, I'd say, oh, absolutely. If you're going to be doing big parties or something, which my daughter-in-law does, she has parties of 15 or 20 pretty often. And she's got a husband who's a chef. It's pretty handy for her to do that. And they have a panini press. But you don't, there's, the, these are not uh, uh, devices that are going to be helpful or handy. And they're bulky and take up too much room, no way, don't need that. So here's a panini, panini less press sandwich discussion. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. So here's the Cuban sandwich. You know, I moved up here at the end of my army career. I was in uh, Tampa working for General Schwarzkopf. And, um, and so we moved up here and they, those people in Tampa know something about a Cuban sandwich. There are the two schools of Cuban sandwich. There's the Miami school and the Tampa school. Uh, and so my influence is Tampa. And there's one key ingredient that these uh, Tampa Cuban sandwiches have. A Cuban sandwich is all pork. And uh, so just be aware, it's all pork. And um, I was surprised at that, but uh, all this all this pork stuff. And, and, and it's also Swiss, it's also yellow mustard, you know, yellow mustard doesn't uh, get a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, most recipes don't call for yellow mustard, but this one absolutely does. And it's an important flavor ingredient and the dill pickles are very, very important. But the key thing about a, a, a Cuban sandwich, it's just layered meat and cheese Nothing special, you wouldn't think, but the bread, it, it just makes it a wonderful thing to eat. It's crispy. It, you could hear people bite into a Cuban sandwich, crispy, and yet the bread is soft. So there's bread that's crispy and tough. You have to tear it. There's bread that's so, soft, too soft and won't crisp. But there's all kinds of breads that are wrong for a Cuban sandwich. And this is one of those difficult things to get. I, I, you, I found, I have found a wonderful, wonderful substitute for Cuban bread. 
And that is the Char sandwich rolls. They're in the gluten-free aisle, two in a pack in the freezer and at Hy-Vee. And I mean, they are perfect for this. They're perfect. You'll see me use them all day today because, uh, of course, I'm, I'm a gluten-free guy, but they're, they're wonderful. They are wonderful and, and the perfect texture for a Cuban sandwich. So let's do a Cuban sandwich without a, without a panini. Go ahead, please. Um, we need a sandwich roll. If you don't have that, you could use a baguette. A baguette is tough. Uh, the crust is too, is too tough. Focaccia is okay. Brioche is okay. All those are okay. None of them are as good as this Char sandwich roll. So uh, I, I really recommend these for subs and everything else. Go ahead. Um, so what we got, I used, there's, there's always a spicy pork loin kind of thing that's cooked ahead of time and then cooled and then thinly sliced for these sandwiches. And I use this Hormel, I'd never used it before, but I use this Hormel mesquite barbecue pork loin. And, and it was just great, just great. Of course, if you smoke your own, it would be good too. But uh, this is very convenient and a delicious product. And you need deli thin slices of ham. I used a uh, Black Forest ham, and I gotta say, yeah, about that Black Forest ham. That was not. That was not. I, I think Frick's is better. It, it's a little too thick, but still, those slices of uh, of Frick's, I think, will be a, give you a, a more flavorful sandwich. Swiss cheese, nothing special there. Sliced, uh, diced, diced pickles, and th that's really an important ingredient. And if you want it really spicy, then you could use banana peppers and and dice those with uh, and mix those with the dill pickles, but that's not necessary. You do need yellow mustard, and mayonnaise helps a lot. So let's look at how how it looks how you stack it up there. Next slide, please. So I use this 10 inch saute pan, Teflon uh, saute pan. I use this thing all the time. Oh my gosh, I use this thing all the time. This pan has just become my go-to pan with that induction cooktop. It's so great and things brown so nicely. And I put that heavy three quart saucepan on the burner. I mean, it, I got it hot too. Put my sandwich, uh, oh, I put put butter in in the pan, uh, and it it was started to brown. I put the sandwich down there, and then I put this screeching hot pan on top of it. There was my panini press, three minutes each side. It browned beautifully. The cheese melted. Every all the flavors came together, and the texture was just right. I, you couldn't in Ebor City. You couldn't get a better. Cuban sandwich than than the ones that I was able to do, I was able to do here. They, sorry, if you are picking up the noise there, they they're putting mulch down around my house. Okay, let's go to the next one there, and I think you'll see. So look how brown it got, and um, that's not the presentation side, but um, brown, crispy, melty cheese. Oh boy, that was a good Cuban sandwich. I've never been able to do them so well until this this venture. Okay, go ahead. Now here we are at the season, Rubens and Rachel's, and I, I wanted to talk about them about, and I I did a lot of uh, looking at each of the ingredients that make uh, the classic uh, Reuben sandwich. Here we are, corned beef season. And I bet I bet most of you have some corned beef in in the refrigerator right now, getting ready for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so let's talk about the difference between corned beef and pastrami. Um, with the next one, please. Um, they're both briskets, and they're both cured. And and. So then after they cure them, then the corned beef, they braise. And, you know, we always simmer, boil it till it's tender. The pastrami, after it's cured, it gets smoked. And we don't do anything with it. We just buy it. 
unless you make your own pastrami, not many people do that, but so, and, and there's always lots of pepper on the pastrami. Those are key differences, that's it. <clears throat> if you have one one week and one the next week, I don't think you're gonna say, oh boy, that is a lot different. That pastrami is a lot different. If you have them side by side, yes, you can see that there's difference in them, but they're pretty similar. And I, I would say that having a Rachel with pastrami or a Reuben with corned beef, you could you could alternate that and uh, no no one would know the difference. You could mix these products up and be legitimate in in the fact that you've got a Reuben, but you put pastrami on it. Or you have a Rachel and you put sauerkraut on it. That sort of thing is easy. I love boar's head. I love boar's head products. If I can buy boar's head anything, I buy it. It's not hard, to, not easy to find, and it's not cheap. But their pastrami and their corned beef is superior to the Hy-Vee Deli brand. I don't even know the name of the Deli brand, but that's what I got for these tips, these sandwiches. And I and I used the Deli the Deli brand of corned beef and pastrami, and I would say that they were very good. But boar's head would be excellent. <laughs> so I'd seek it out if you have a chance. This time of year, you cannot buy a whole uh, a whole boar's head uh, brisket. They, it's, the de demand is just too high. They sell out of everything they have. So you probably, it's too late to get one for, for this season. Boils are Kansas City brand of brisket of, of, of uh, corned beef is excellent as well and but they don't have it in the in the store except during this spring season so um th these are boar's head and bo boils are just not not going to be available to you unless you grab them as soon as they appear a few weeks ago is the first time that you would have seen a whole brisket from boar's head in in the grocery store you you'd have to grab it then because it's gone okay so next slide please so there's a, a famous dressing on on Reuben sandwiches, uh, Thousand Island dressing, and always for uh, at school as we were showing the students uh, the uh, the Reubens and having sandwich lab, which is very important for for culinary students to learn these techniques because I mean sandwiches and it is big business, and there's a lot of technique and doing them for crowds and doing them to order for many hundreds of people really uh, it's there's a lot to learn. And so we always bought Thousand Island dressing. And it's, it's un, um, to me, it's uh, a, a nice flavor, but make it from scratch and it's a great flavor. So I really recommend going to the extra effort of making Thousand Island dressing. It's wonderful. The sauerkraut on, on Rubens is usually mixed with that Thousand Island dressing. And this particular version, I I sweated. I mean, I put the sauerkraut in in my famous 10 inch Teflon pan and, and cooked it down to dry it out. And I added some cider vinegar and brown sugar. And it was the right thing to do. It really did for this particular brand of sauerkraut that I used. It really was great. Some sauerkrauts don't need that enhancement. They're great, just washed and mixed with the Thousand Island, but I just really enjoyed the flavor that apple cider vinegar and brown sugar brought to the sauerkraut. I thought it was great. And uh, shredded uh, Swiss cheese is recommended rather than the thick slices. It's hard to get those thick slices to melt really nicely. So if you shred it, it gets, it really gives a nice, gets the, gets the cheese to melt in there with the meat and it really is it, it eats well and and uh, performs really well too and then the hearty rye bread uh and there's pumpernickel and all those other kinds of rye bread rye is one of those things that uh, those of us who who don't who who are gluten intolerant uh, can't eat so i haven't had a piece of rye bread in 20 years. <laughs> I know what it tastes like because it tastes like it smells, right? 
But I, I use my bread, and you know that to be the, uh, the one of the char breads. You'll see it, and it's a great substitute for that rye bread. But uh, And you probably have your favorites, too. And then the corned beef brisket really, really should be sliced paper thin. And that the only way to do that is to slice it cold uh, rather than big chunks of it. I think it's much better paper thin. Okay, go ahead. So we've got all our ingredients lined up here. Here, here are the Thousand Island ingredients. And that is a sweet pickle relish, a cock, the, the Heinz cocktail sauce. I don't use it. I haven't had it in my kitchen um in many years but i got it for this to to get, really give you a taste test on this uh on this recipe and then and then hellman's excellent mayonnaise and that is you just want to sit there with a spoon and have that snappy wonderful thousand island dressing my pickle relish came from a a hot major hot dog event we had here last year some birthday party or something and I just had an all out hot dog spread with different kinds of hot dogs and all kinds of stuff. And it, it was hanging around since that time. And I think it probably was past its prime. It's a little, it was a little, taste, tasted a little sharp to me. Molly had been in the can or jar for too long. So I would say, watch that, get one. Don't you get the one in the back of your refrigerator, buy fresh ones for this. Okay, go ahead. So that's our thousand island dressing. Oh, it's really good. It's worth it. And the sauerkraut. Now, the test kitchen, America's test kitchen, has done very extensive testing of brand, the major brands of sauerkraut, and the ones that that taste test the best include Libby's and our fair friend Boar's Head sauerkraut. They they test excellent. I like Frank's and use Frank's. It comes in a can which is less appealing than coming in a bag like that. But I like it. It's good. And that's what I used. Rinsing and draining sauerkraut is a controversial thing. And you'll see many German recipes that, uh, you know, warn you not to drain them and so forth. But I think it just depends on how you like that, how you like that particular brand that you're using. So as I said, sweat it in, in heat to dry it out. One of your problems with the Reuben sandwiches. It, it's a two sandwich, a two napkin sandwich, right? But one napkin for your face and one napkin for the plate because you just build this pool of juice under a Reuben sandwich. It's really a, uh, it's really a messy sandwich with juicy juice wise. And so, if you get all the juice you can out of the sauerkraut, that'll help your sandwich. You got to brown the Cuban. I mean, brown the the the, uh, the Reuben and put it on the plate and tell them go eat <laughs> while you do the next one. No messing around. Bread gets soggy. Okay. You can solve that problem of the bread getting soggy. You can help with that problem of the bread getting soggy by putting the cheese as insulators. Uh, the cheese on the inside of the of the pieces of bread, as you see right there, and then that helps uh, keep it from uh, so making the bread soggy. So you spread the dressing, our Thousand Island dressing, on one, on one side of both slices, and then Swiss cheese on top of that, which is against, you know, to keep, to waterproof it. And then the corned beef and the sauerkraut in the middle, and then put them together, butter the outside of one slice of bread and put that down, hot, hot side down, and then, butter the top, and then cover it. No panini press required. And putting it in under a cover is the secret to having it warm through, cheese melty, delicious. A wonderful sandwich. Okay. So what if we wanted to have paninis, uh, uh, Rachel's with our, our pastrami, then one thing that you could do, an alternative to the Thousand Island dressing that we served with a Reuben, is to spice the Thousand Island up with horseradish. Now, if you're going to do that, use prepared horseradish uh, that it comes in a cooler um, at the deli. It's not the stuff that's shelf stable, which 
uh, is never as good as prepared horseradish and uh, much as you like. And uh, my family likes a lot of it, except for my wife. She prefers, she does not prefer uh, my horseradish sauce when we have pot roast or whatever. I eat it all the time. I love it. And then there's coleslaw on a Rachel, traditionally not sauerkraut, coleslaw. If you want to add a really, a, a great flavor enhancement to your Reuben, use Gruyere. Did you see the news about Gruyere this week? The USDA is now allowing American cheesemakers to use the term Gruyere. I told you the last time that we talked uh, about that I, you could you could go to the bank of, about the term Gruyere. It would be German or Swiss cheese made and imported if it said Gruyere on the package. No longer true. Pretty soon you're going to be able to see Kraft Gruyere. Uh, we hope that they'll keep the standards up for flavor. But now we're going to have to read the label on Gruyere cheese more carefully. And then, and then uh, deli sliced pastrami. Again, very thin, if possible. Okay, next slide, please. I, I absolutely recommend and prefer a coleslaw mix like this rather than buying giant heads of cabbage and mess of shredding it in your kitchen. And then you've got to have the, uh, it's just, it's just a mess. I always make two meals out of a head of, of cabbage. I, I make slaw and then I, then we have it uh, steamed or boiled um, to have with corned beef, for example. I love corn, I love uh, cabbage, but, but buying it for this particular purpose is a mess and I don't recommend it. I, I love this Fresh Express product and they, they, ha they have the, some purple, some garnish in there that's pretty, it's good. And, and I recommend that for your slaw. I grew up on Coleman's dressing for slaw and I thought I, when I left home, I will never ever have a bottle of that stuff in my refrigerator again. My mother loved it, and I can't stand it. I just, I just really, I, I really recommend that you make your slaw dressing. And I think a secret to the slaw dressing is to shred onions, uh, shred them. We don't shred onions very often. We dice them up and all that, slice them and uh, slice and dice them. But uh, shred them, they they really do lend themselves to a slaw very well. Um, and and sour, besides the mayonnaise, sour cream really does make a, a slaw dressing nice. And white wine vinegar, not white vinegar, not not rice vinegar, not. I'm not apple wine vinegar. I'm saying white wine vinegar and first quality white wine vinegar and a little sugar. That's a good slaw. And it goes great on the sandwich. Okay, next, next one, please. Uh, now, I have been to Chick-fil-A a, a grand total of one time in my life. And, uh, and I had a very fine sandwich. They don't have a crispy spicy fried chicken sandwich that's gluten-free and Chick-fil-A. So, you know, I had a broiled chicken sandwich and it was fine. But, uh, and, and in the last year, I believe Carol and I have been out to eat once. <laughs> so I just don't go out to eat. It's just not, it's just not what we're doing here at this stage in our, in our senior years. So, um, but I love, the spicy fried chicken sandwich idea, crispy, hot, moist, with with a good dressing on there. Uh, oh boy, I mean, it's a great sandwich. That one time that Carol and I went out, we went to McDonald's, believe it or not. She said, when we pulled up into the handicapped parking spot, right in front of her was a big sign that says, we have a Spicy fried chicken sandwich, crispy fried chicken sandwich or something like that. 
Oh, she said, I'm going to have that. So before we even walked in there, uh, really looking forward to our first McDonald's experience in a long, long time. And uh, she had that and she thought it was delicious and great. And of course, I couldn't have it. So. But anyway, I wanted to make sh- I wanted to make sure that I that I figured out a way for us to have these crispy things, crispy chicken sandwiches, because you can use the same technique for cod, for tuna. I mean, you, you could make anything crispy uh, by this technique and put it on sandwich and have a really, really satisfying crispy fried chicken sandwich experience. So it, in, it, it entails panko breadcrumbs. And I, I, I had never used panko in my professional cooking, uh, it, except for oriental dishes. It was an oriental ingredient that we just didn't use. If you wanted breading, then it was flour and breadcrumbs and so forth. And panko is just a, kind of a a thing that was not commonly used in the, in the kitchens with the, with the cuisine that I I uh, practiced. So I had to learn and go back to school on panko breadcrumbs. And um, so the, also the chicken breast, when I, I want to get these giant chicken breasts in the, you know, the three of them in a, in the little styrofoam package, they, they're way crazy amount. They're huge things. And I always turn them into scallopini. You know, I always slice them thin this way. I never had even thought uh, that I ought to cut them this way, crosswise. And it was an aha moment. And you'll see in a minute how it's just fundamentally changed how I cook chicken breasts from now on because they're better, thicker than they are paper thin. They're moist. You can bread them way better. So that was a good thing to learn. And then uh, I'm in this particular technique, I made the, usually it's a three-step thing to bread something, right? You go from uh, flour, seasoned flour, then to an egg wash, and then onto the breadcrumbs. But in this particular technique, the egg and flour is mixed together, and seasoning goes in there. So it's only two two stage breading, and then onto the panko, and then into the air fryer. And these chicken breasts, even though they're pretty darn thick, they cook in ten minutes. I say twelve here because I, I don't want you to. Uh, you know, I want you to be really comfortable with the, the temperature of those things. But I mean, they're done in 10 minutes, five minutes on each side uh, in that air fryer at 400. And then the classic thing to do is, is mayonnaise and, and iceberg lettuce. You know, we don't serve much iceberg lettuce, but because it has no nutritional value and it's not even very pretty. Um, it's just a bunch of crunch. But it's perfect for this sandwich, and I recommend it. Now, that, that version of the sandwich is extra spicy in that there's seasoning Tabasco in the egg flour mixture. There are jalapenos on there, and and it seems like, um, oh, and lots of pepper. So, I mean, it's very spicy. So, if you don't want it quite so spicy, you can tame it down by going with pickles. And that makes still an excellent salad. Sandwiches need a pickle, don't they? I mean, every time I think of sandwiches, I think of pickles. And they should should have that. They add so much. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the station. You see, I cut the chicken breasts into these nice triangles. And by cutting it that way, they're all the same size. I pounded them to make them thinner. And uh, I just use it an old spoon on them and beat them down there until they were all kind of uniformly thin. Now the panko that I use, of course, is gluten-free panko. Oh, you say, I didn't know there was such a thing, but there is. And it's, it is, I've, I've been using it until this, uh, this month wrong. I have been just putting it, up there and going through my breading station from the flour to the egg and then onto the panko and then in the frying things. And the 
Panko never did do well for me. It's too crunchy. I mean, it hurts your mouth to crunch it. It's too crunchy. You can hear yourself eating. I said, it, it was just all wrong. And, I, and so I was always thinking, man, I don't use this much. I use panko all the time for meatloaf, for making a what we call a panade, you know, uh, because it ha- it absorbs enough moisture to become soft. But here's a technique that I just learned, and it's wonderful, and that is to brown the panko. So that's a cup of panko. It has two tablespoons of olive oil in it, and I microwaved it for two minutes, and I kept stirring it, and it just turned beautifully brown. brown. It was softer. And you're going to see when I put it in the air fryer, it's already brown which was before I learned to brown the panko, my things were pale and never browned. Now they brown because I browned them before that put them in the, in the air fryer. So that, you know, there's, there's some good things to learn about panko. I'm, I'm back on panko now as, a, as an ingredient that I'm going to use to make crispy breading. Next slide, please. So here it is. That's, that's how they came out of the air fryer. I thought I had a slide to show you them going into the air fryer. Maybe that's the next one. And so instead of the jalapenos, I used pickles on this salad and I used uh, spinach. I love spinach uh, instead of lettuce. And I used my bread, which is Char's multigrain. And that crispy sandwich, crispy chicken sandwich, got to say, Great sandwich, really delicious. And it did three breasts, did the did uh I think I ate two and my wife ate one. And so we had the, the next meal, those those crispy chicken breasts were just as good the next day as they were in the sandwich. That was great. Okay. Um, you know. I learned the French dip sandwich when I was uh, 15 years old. I went to Seattle. I had a, uh, my my uh, relatives live in, in uh, Tacoma, actually. And uh, the World's Fair was there and the Space Needle and so forth. And, and my mother went out there and spent whole summer. But I, I only got to join her for uh, a couple of weeks. And it was a, it was a wonderful summer for a 15-year-old. We dug clams on Puget Sound. We... We, I had fruit from Hawaii. They, they my my uh, Washington State relatives eat a a lot of tropical fruit, which I had never had before in my life. Had never had a papaya. Had never had a mango. I had ne- no idea what that stuff was, and so I learned about that. And my uncle took me to a bowling alley uh, at the maybe it was at the uh, golf course, and we sat down at the bar, which I thought was really a fabulous experience. And we had a French dip sandwich, beef on a roll with some cheese dipped in this delicious jus. And I've loved this. I've loved this French dip sandwich idea all my life. I just think it's a wonderful idea, and I always do it anytime I I have leftover roast beef. Um, then I try to make sandwiches with it and and never really been able to hit the high points of a great French dip sandwich. So this time I bought (laughs) deli roast beef. I thought, why, why not? Why not try it? And so I tried the deli medium, I guess it's it's almost medium rare, but the, the medium roast beef from the deli and I used my, my char uh, san- sandwich rolls and better than bouillon base for the jus and some provolone cheese. That yeah, was a good sandwich. I mean, it's you don't want to serve it to guests or anything, uh, but I'd say that if you want a French dip sandwich experience, do it from the deli. And you'll you'll like it if you like rare roast beef. Um, so there you go. And uh, let's see the next one. A uh, sloppy Joe. We we grew up with them, didn't we? We we got them in the ca- cafeteria. It was on the rotating menu of the cafeteria all the years I was uh, in school in Platte County, and um, yeah, it was great. 
it was a great meal for me. I, it was a big day. I, I loved it. I, I went to school early and <laughs> get in line for the sloppy joes on those soft buns. And, um, and so I, I went to the America's Test Kitchen for their version of a sloppy joe because I have not been able to make one that is as uh, honest, a re- honest uh, way of making one similar to what I grew up loving. All that Manwich stuff and all of those other brands of it, I think, are are awful. But here is a, and I'll, I'll put it in the recipe packet, here is a from scratch Sloppy Joe that I believe you'll really like. And then if you'll promise to use Kraft American slices and put it on a soft bun, I can't eat those soft buns, but I wish I could. Serve it with dill pickles and milk. <laughs> it's a great sandwich. And I, I think that Scratch made, that this version of, of the Scratch made Sloppy Joe's is really good. It's really tasty. You'll like it. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, chili dogs, I have always, uh, I have always used Hormel chili for my chili dogs and never, I've never liked my chili dogs as much as I do when I go out someplace, when I used to go out some places and have a chili dog, like, like Sonic Drive-In. Theirs is better. Sonic Drive-In's chili dog is better than my chili dog. And I, I it was, it was because I always relied on Hormel chili and that's just not as good a product as scratch made. So I will put a recipe for scratch made chili for chili dogs. Another another uh, thing that I liked about this test kitchen version of chili dogs is that they use American cheese from the deli, not the little slices, but the blocks. And that really does melt nicely and really does give you a great sauce, cheese sauce, to put over your chili dogs, which I think is really great. We're going to have uh, my family's coming for Carol's 80th birthday in in April. And um, so I told them um, uh, the last time my family got together that I'm going to have this going to be spring. It's, it, we'll have several meals over several days. And I said, one of us going to be a great hot dog experience. And uh, so my son's lining up his favorite hot dogs and all the ingredients will have the Chicago style with the, with the pe- pepper sport peppers, I think they call them. And all those Chicago ingredients that you don't normally see around. Although Freddy's it seems they advertise it. I haven't had one, but they advertise a Chicago hot dog, but I know many places in Kansas city have tried to make Chicago hot dogs go but they don't they don't sell in Kansas City very well. A lot of places have been out of business over the years trying to trying to sell a Chicago style hot dog. But I love it. If you've been through O'Hare and you haven't had a a hot dog, <laughs> you should do that next time you go through there. Aren't you excited about the new airport? Oh for crying out loud. But the paper this morning was such a downer about the delays in picking up picking up customers, read it and learn before you go. Carol and I are going to have a date. We're going to put my camera over my shoulder and get our handicap parking sign <laughs> handy and go to the airport and try some of the some of the food. And I want to get pictures of that beautiful place. I bet they don't have a hot uh, Chicago hot dog there, though. Okay, next slide. A uh, po boy is, you know, one of those things that always come to mind, especially as people are headed to Mardi Gras and so forth, that fried oyster sandwich. <clears throat> and I do love fried oysters. I just don't think that the bread adds a single thing. I think it detracts. I think it's so, just have fried oysters. <laughs> Forget that bread stuff. And they're so small and cook so quickly 
You do not need to have a deep fryer. In fact, that's totally unnecessary, a big, a big waste. All you need is just a, a little bit of a small pan with a little bit of oil in there. And um, a, one of those commercial uh, uh, breading uh, flour uh, will crisp up beautifully in just a small amount of oil and then make a, a spicy mayonnaise and enjoy those with tomatoes and lettuce and forget about the bun. <laughs> but the problem is, where do you get the oysters? Uh, canned oysters uh, don't, don't do this very well. They're too small and they, they're just, I don't know. I, they never seem to fry for me. I guess maybe I, they're too saturated can get them dry enough and they just uh they don't just don't crisp up so you have to get a get a pint of of those that are shucked already i hope that your seafood seafood station at your hive or your rest your, your grocery store will do that for you will shuck the oysters and then then i, I just recommend that you have Ho boys in name only and forget about the, the the bread, which kind of makes them not nearly as flavorful. It just waters down their flavor to my taste. Now, a pulled pork sandwich is one of those Carolina things. And I've I've eaten them in the Carolinas. I, I caravaned uh, camping caravan for two months in up and down the East Coast. Uh, and every place we went, they were trying to, uh, the, you know, they were featuring their pulled pork sandwich. Oven roasted pork, uh, ordinary slaw. And I always thought you you can do way better than a Carolina style pulled pork, oven roasted pork. If you can get your hands on some delicious barbecued pork and center the pulled pork sandwich around fabulous Kansas City style barbecue pork butt. That's that's something, it's, a, it's an ordeal. It takes me, and I talked in the barbecue session last year about smoking a pork butt. It's an all day deal. You not, it's all day. It's a big, big effort. And, I don't think you can buy a good one except by going to Joe's or Q39 Gates and buying their buying their pork. So that's what I recommend. You want to have great pulled pork sandwiches for a crowd. Don't oven roast it. Get great barbecue pork. Use great Kansas City barbecue sauce. Use uh, the cheese, those soft rolls like they have at Q39 or Joe's rather. And this one, this version is Joe's Z-Man. <clears throat> There's a disc jockey here in Kansas City that's, I, I believe I have this story, part, part of the story, right? And there's a disc jockey who, who ordered this sandwich at Joe's. And so they just, and his name is Z-Man. So it got this sandwich at Joe's got named for him and their version has those onion rings on it. That's a great sandwich. And so I'm saying that having a pulled pork sandwich in the Carolina style is not going to get many accolades from your, from your guest. But if you combine the slaw, put the slaw on the side. <laughs> And you, you do this style of pulled pork sandwich in the Kansas City style and doesn't have the sloppy coleslaw on it. It's a great sandwich. So I recommend it. Uh, go ahead. Here's my tuna salad after a test kitchen technique. Uh, I'm making the best tuna salad I've ever made and doesn't look good. It looks like seafood salad. Doesn't look like tuna salad the way they recommend that you do it, which is to take the tuna out of the can, 
And the and the America's Test Kitchen strongly recommends chicken of the sea white albacore tuna in water, which incidentally, and this is the only tuna that I ever buy. And um, they press it in a strainer with paper towels and dr dry it out, get all of that canning liquid pressed out of the tuna, and then they flake it, break it up into the flakes. It's changed the appearance so much. And then they make a, um, a spicy mayonnaise, lemon juice and, and sugar of all things, and pepper uh, in the mayonnaise. And then they, they cook, sweat onions in olive oil to season the olive oil. And then marinate the tuna in this seasoned olive oil. And at the very last, they add the mayonnaise to it, fluff it up, and serve it. It, it makes it a delicious sandwich, but I just serve it as a salad. And I so recommend taking these extra steps. You will be surprised how the marination of the, of the olive oil, seasoned olive oil, really does complement the the tuna flavor and it it's it's just very very nice dish uh the way they describe it though is serve it immediately <clears throat> and i think it's so much better cold so i, I don't i don't want to serve it to room temperature i think that's that puts that's off-putting for me i want it really bone chilling cold okay next slide please yeah, here's all the ingredients, the mise en place for tuna fish. You see how it flakes up like that. Um, and uh, I did not use fresh ground pepper on this. I'm, I'm trying to finish that bottle of uh, coarse black pepper that I have for my barbecue rubs. And I can't get rid of it. I'm down to the last thing. I'm about to throw the whole thing away. Um, but certainly fresh ground pepper is going to add a lot to this mayonnaise. The lemon juice, the celery, that's a really good tuna salad. Okay, next one, please. Uh, cheeseburger, you've seen me, uh, since I don't eat those soft white buns, um, that our hamburger here is bunless, but they're delicious. The bun doesn't add any flavor to a hamburger. It's it's that soft white bun. All it does is just let you get it up to your mouth <laughs> without having your hands so greasy. But no flavor. So my hamburgers, I, you know, I just, I love them without the bun. And it's kind of like the old hamburger steak that we used to have. It's delicious. Mustard, pickles, and onions, I believe, is the American classic. It, uh, it's what I learned at Homer's Restaurant in Leavenworth, a famous drive-in drive, drive -in restaurant, still going. And he chopped onions. I saw him do it from 1950 on. Chopped the onions, very important, rather than slices. And he smashes the charcoal, I mean, the, the hamburger on a very hot griddle, like is very trendy now. Go to all of these wonderful restaurants in Kansas City that are, that are uh, based on, on a wonderful high quality hamburger and it's usually smashed. But if you put them on a char, char broiler, they're better. Burger King has a better hamburger than these other places because it's charbroil. Okay, there you go. My thoughts on, on cheeseburgers. Iced tea is uh, my drink, daily drink. I usually have it just for dinner, but sometimes lunch. And um, I, have, I have always made sun tea uh, in season. I don't want to go out on the deck in the cold. So when it turns warm, then I'm going to take a, my 
clear jug out there that will hold about it'll hold a gallon but i don't ever put a gallon in there i put about three quarts in there and i use six tea bags and i sit it in the sun till it turns about that color and um uh, and i and i like that um the problem with it and the problem with all tea is they don't last but maybe it's okay for lunch the next day but by dinner the next day it's not good Tea just very, um, the the it just sours or it it's not tasty after just a few hours, and sun tea has even shorter life than than cold brew. So when it's not when there's when it's not comfortable to go outside, I do cold brew on my. Uh, counter with the cold brew Lipton tea. Again, I use six bags and three quarts, and immediate and and the water is room temperature tepid, and then I put it immediately into the refrigerator, and it's okay the second day, usually. But still, it's not as good. So that's a very mild tea. Uh, either cold brewed or sun tea is um, a little more mellow. Also, those are not st strong, flavorful, classic, hot brewed iced tea. My ratio is way low on the amount of tea bags that I use in iced tea to make really great iced tea. Uh, the ratio for hot brewed tea and well the process i think i don't know if my next slide has it or not but let's just stick with this and i'll just give it to you from memory on your left is the cold brewed tea with three quarts of water and six tea bags and it steeps for i don't know 15 or 20 minutes to get to that color and flavor it's okay i think they would call it flat the experts on the other hand the tea in the upper right is hot brewed, and that is six tea bags in one quart of water, and you bring the and you bring the water to 190 degrees. Don't boil it. You bring it to 190 degrees, get it off the fire, steep it no more than three minutes. Just steep it no more than three minutes, or it turns bitter. Get the tea bags out of there and then immediately put in a quart of ice cubes and melt those that brings it to like room temperature. And then you serve that over a glass full of ice. And that is a very, a, a very excellent drink. It's really an excellent drink. And in, and in with one, two, six uh, teaspoons of sugar in that quart, what started out as a quart, becomes two quarts, uh, for, for you Southerners who drink sweet tea, like me. So I use Splenda. But one quart heated with the tea bags to 190, and then let a short short steeping and then add ice an equivalent amount of ice and um and then and then serve that so it happens pretty quick especially if you have an induction burner a quart of a quart of uh water comes to 190 very quickly a minute or two so my hot brewed tea is faster than my cold brewed tea and much more delicious so you worry about and the and the folklore surrounding iced tea um, is a concern about the caffeine and and, and I, so I I did some number crunching here on on iced tea two cups of tea of iced tea is is the caffeine equivalent of a cup of coffee and so. Well, that's not bad. That's good, in fact. Um, 
so I would say that the folklore around around tea being much more caffeinated than coffee is just that urban legend. If you if you're comfortable having a co- a cup of coffee or two, caffeinated coffee or two, uh, then your iced tea, if you limit the amount that you have, is not going to appreciably increase your caffeine content that, that you have. I have not done any any t- testing and tasting of decaffeinated uh, tea. I'm on, I'm going to do that. Um, and I'm also uh, gonna gonna look at uh, the caffeine that we consume in our cappuccinos each day. So I'm I'm on to reducing the caffeine in our diet uh, as as a goal for the summer. And and my wife doesn't drink as much iced tea as I do, so that'll be easy to to reduce the amount of caffeine. I think that's it. Uh, just as a matter of interest, the the Cappuccinos that we that we have uh, in the morning, we usually have two. I have three, and my wife has two. They have an ounce and a half of caffeine, which is the equivalent of twelve ounces of coffee. So my my cappuccino, one cappuccino, is the equivalent of two cups of coffee. So that's that's okay. If I'm limiting myself to two cappuccinos, I'm not getting too much caffeine there. I don't think I'm too concerned about the amount of caffeine. I uh, next slide, please. Oh, here it is all spelled out for you. Five tea bags and a quart. I said six. Um, up to 190, I was right there. It's a steep at short period of time, stirring the sugar, stirring ice until melted and stir an ice-filled glass. A bartender who gives you one or two ice cubes in a glass is cheating you because it will water that drink down in a minute. Your glass really must be full of ice to put a liquid in there and keep it from being watered down by the ice. It's just the opposite of what you would think. You would think, oh, I don't want to put so much ice in there because it'll water my drink down. Just the opposite. Fill it to the top as much ice as you can get in there and the drink will stay flavorful to all the way, all the way down. So I encourage you to do that. Okay. Okay. I think I have one more. Oh boy. I got it. This is a good Christmas present that I got. I got these little lights, the little strips of lights. And they have a motion detector on them, and you just stick them onto the whatever you got. I put some in my, uh, I have them around the house. I got two packages of them, and and th- in this particular case, I lighted, the, I lit the um, carousel where I keep all my spices, and it's it, it's like a great experience to open it up and see all the way back. It just made that space, all the spaces. And I have another carousel below this one for appliances, and I have it lit. That is a neatest little thing. I don't want the light shining in my eyes, you know, like a, you know, scaring me when I open the door because I forget that it's lit in there. And this does not come on when I open the door. It only comes on when I touch the the carousel and turn it. And, then, oh, it senses that motion and pops on. It's just great. I love it. Great trick. Uh, next slide, please. Here are my portion cups. Uh, the ones on the right are the ones I just took out to glass recycling, and I got a st- stack of those little three and a half ounce ones. I love them. They 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 nest so neat. I use them every single day for every single thing I do. Everything. I just they're so they're so neat for the the style of cooking that I do. I love these. Portion cups. They're not uh, Pyrex, by the way, so can't put them in the oven, but they hold up really great in the dishwasher. I've washed them a million times and they just look brand new. Okay, next. I think the last one. So, um, so good to talk to you all and uh, to tell you what I learned about sandwiches, which was a lot of learning here for me uh, on, on this subject because um, I, I wanted to go back and get, get the new perspective of how things have changed. 
I only buy groceries through aisles online. I drive up there, open the trunk, and they put them in the car, and I bring them home, put them to use. And so the products that I'm limited to are those that I can get that way because I we we just uh, aren't, aren't able to get get to out go out and shop uh, anymore. So all of these things were products that I could get readily without running all over town trying to find time to go to de delis, spe special del delis and that sort of thing. I'm sorry I ran over time. So good to talk to you all. Um, I, I do have some recipes uh, in a packet that I'll, I'll get to uh, Jonathan. Uh, so yeah, anybody have any questions or comments? I look forward to talking to you next month. I, I told Jonathan I thought I'd do pizza and pasta next month. So we'll uh, that, that was my next question. What was next month? So pizza and pasta. Sounds pizza good. and pasta. And I'll, I'll get you a, a discussion of it. I found a recipe for a deep dish Chicago pizza that I can't wait, can't wait to work on. <laughs> Talk right. to you soon. So good to see you. Thanks a lot, John.